Hi everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your guest, Ricardo Lopez, and today we have a return guest. He is Dr. Stephen Hicks. He teaches philosophy at Rockford University and is also the author of some books like Explaining Postmodernism, which we analyzed in our previous interview, and I will leave a link to that in the description box. Please go and watch it. It's very interesting. And also Nietzsche and the Nazis, which will be one of the objects of our interview today, mm. but we'll be talking about Nietzsche in general, in general, particularly when applied to the influences he had on Nazism, supposedly, and also on postmodernism. So, Dr. X, mm. welcome again on the show. Thank you a lot Thanks. for taking the time, and I yeah. hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. And it's a pleasure to be back. Okay, great. So let's just jump right into the questions. And so uh, we all know, I think, that Nietzsche was a very controversial figure in philosophical history. And he was very unorthodox and things like that. And sometimes he was really obscure. So I would like to go perhaps through some of the main criticisms he had of the Enlightenment. And mm. perhaps the first two are related to rationality and objectivity. So could mm. you please expo expose briefly what were his views on these two topics? Mm. Well, uh, to put it bluntly, he would uh, say that objectivity is a myth. Uh, it does not exist, that it cannot exist. Uh, he is a very strong subjectivist in his epistemology. Uh, and by that we mean a, a hardcore philosophical subjectivism, not just that things are personalized or individualized, but rather that uh, what we call knowledge, right, and we start putting things in quotation marks, uh, has very little to do with anything that's actually going on out in reality, whatever that is, but that rather it speaks much more to the subject and that subject's instincts and biases and preconditions and habits and values. As for uh, uh, rationality, uh, Nietzsche would say briefly that it does exist, but it is uh, an extraordinarily weak capacity, uh, very fragile, uh, very much uh, a subject to a person's uh, underlying drives and passions and instincts and uh, perhaps at best what we now would call uh, at least in English rationalization uh, that after you have decided what you want to believe or what you want to do you try to figure out a story or, 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 a, or a justification that will enable you to pursue that so there is no objectivity and rationality is a very weak capacity now, obviously, that's uh, very anti-Enlightenment, because for the Enlightenment figures of, say, a century before Nietzsche, our capacity for reason was our uh, most distinctive and most importantly powerful capacity as human beings. And they were well aware that it's possible for people to be subject to biases and passions and rationalizations and so forth. But with personal effort, with good training, with commitment, with uh, intellectual honesty and integrity, we can achieve objectivity and even truth. So, yeah, very much he is an anti-enlightenment figure in that way. Mm -hmm. Yes, and about his views on individualism, because he mm. was not that clear about individualism. Because on the one hand, he espoused the view of the Ubermensch, right? So that is sure. for strong men to rise above the sheep, let's say, the, that is the people that he considered <coughs> to be or, the sheep. To, or to have a mentality yes. of or a slave mentality, right? Right. Uh, but on the other hand, he seems to put a very strong emphasis on the fact that people, uh, as you just alluded to, have an unsurmountable an unsurmountable biological heritage and so it seems that people can't really go beyond their natural impulses so right, w right. what what is it about it okay well, this is a, a complex uh, topic and i, I wrote a, a long journal article uh it was uh, contrasting friedrich nietzsche 
and Ayn Rand on their views on altruism and egoism. And so, in the self-promotion vein, for my detailed views on this, I would recommend going there. Uh, but it, you also mentioned the book Nietzsche and the Nazis, and there is some discussion of Nietzsche's alleged individualism there. Now, let me say there are definitely individualistic elements in Nietzsche. And I think most young people, when they read Nietzsche, because he's a great stylist, uh, and we want to find ourselves, we want our lives to be meaningful and significant, and we're, we're, we're disgusted by the number of people already who seem to be passive and to have sold out, or people who by the time they've gotten to middle age, they've kind of given up on life and seem very, uh, uh, um, I don't know, uh, what are the disgusting words that we can use, and Nietzsche is, is, is full with this, right? That you don't want to turn into those kinds of people that you mostly see in your neighborhood, right, who are basically just waiting for death. They are on a slow, passive road to death. So Nietzsche, with his call to live dangerously, to uh, not sell your highest dreams out, uh, is very attractive and sounds very individualistic. And he certainly, uh, in contrast to prevailing other philosophies that are socialistic, where socialists are saying, merge yourself with the group, expect the group and the government to look after you and see yourself as a victim uh, that's getting beaten up on by the man and you can't control yourself because all these tough people are out there putting you down. To, uh, to fight for yourself, not see yourself as a victim uh, against those uh, still fairly prominent views of religious authoritarianism and religious traditionalism, and not to find your own way that's all been worked out. These, there are these truths that all you have to do is accept them and be faithful and obedient. Uh, otherwise, uh, if, you, if you violate any of these rules, you're going to go to hell and bad things will happen to you. So all of that use of fear and guilt and obedience and conformity. Nietzsche very much is a rebel against all of those. And I think those are the individualistic elements that most of us who have a, some human dignity to ourselves respond to uh, and so forth. Now, all of that said, I want to argue, as I do in the book and so forth, that Nietzsche is not fundamentally an individualist. Uh, and this is a, partly a complex question, but we have to start by asking, well, what do we mean by individuals uh, and individualism? And if we again use, say, the Enlightenment version of individualism as our foil or as our, our contrast object, the first thing you have to uh, believe is that metaphysically or ontologically, when we talk about human beings, there are such things as individuals that we are individual human beings, we are not fragments of the divine, we are not elements of a collective, instead that each of us as individuals has some uniqueness, specialness, control over our own thoughts, control over our actions and our, and our destiny. And for various philosophical, mostly metaphysical reasons, Nietzsche rejects all of that. He is very forthright in his metaphysical writings about human beings in saying that the individual, as we have conceived him, is a myth. There are no such things as individuals. What we call an individual is a, a bundle of drives, a bundle of instincts, and most of them are at war with each other. So this idea that we have autonomy, that we decide who we are going to be, that we're controlling our actions, that we have any sort of rational autonomy, all of that to Nietzsche is a, is a myth. So to put it bluntly, Nietzsche does not believe that individuals even exist. That's, a, that's a, an after-the-fact construct or an after-the-fact artifact of our reasoning. <clears throat> Another element of individualism, though, uh, if we, again we try to define the term, is to say that you have some element of control, that you are the one who is the decider, the decision maker, the lawmaker. You have autonomy, however you want to, uh, to put that. And almost always in individualistic writings, that is tied to some belief in volition or in uh, free will, so that we can say, I as an individual am in control of who I am, my thoughts, my opinions, my actions. 
And on the basis of that, I have responsibility. Uh, if I make good choices and I, I can acquire some dignity when I reflect on what I have chosen and what I have done. But it's important here to recognize that Nietzsche is very forthrightly a determinist. He does not believe in individual agency, at least not volitional agency, he does not believe that we choose our thoughts, our passions, our drives, our values, and so on, that we are uh, part of a long-standing fatalistic tradition. Uh, and so if you don't think that people are in control of themselves, it's hard to uh, subscribe to any of the things that follow through that typically are bundled with individualism. Now, what else do we mean by individualism? Well, typically, <clears throat> particularly, excuse me, <clears throat> in its enlightenment form, individualism comes out in a universalistic form. We say all individuals have uh, innate human dignity. Uh, we start to moralize it. Uh, we might use the, the language of, of rights, that all individuals should have the right to life, right to liberty, pursuit of happiness, the right to free speech, the right to make their own judgments in religion and practice how they see fit. Uh, so what we're doing is saying that individuals, all of them, should have basic moral standing, and this should be reflected socially and politically. And so as the Enlightenment spreads, we have an increase in the scope of human rights from the first group uh, initially in, in England and then in France and the United States that are able to institutionalize uh, a conception of human rights and it's extended to women, to people of other ethnicities, of other races, and so on. Now here, uh, uh, it, uh, Nietzsche is very forthright in saying, and this goes back to your sheep remark, that the vast majority of human beings have no moral dignity. They do not have the capacity for moral autonomy. And he is very forthright in saying that the vast majority of people can be used uh, even to the point of slavery, not just metaphorical slavery, but actual physical legal slavery for the benefit of those he thinks are the elite beings that may have the capacity to take human beings to the next level, the, the ubermensch stuff and so on. So. From that perspective, it's very hard to see as an individualist someone who denies the moral worth of the vast majority of hu actual human individuals. So that's another blow against right, Nietzsche's individualism. So what we're left with, I think, is the, the, the justifiable view that Nietzsche's individualism rests on his hopes for that small elite number of special individuals who are not sheep, who have some vitality, some uniqueness, some specialty, some ability to get their act together and really go out and make a mark on the world by whatever means. And we abstract away from their particular agendas, whether it's a, an artistic agenda, a scientific agenda, a political agenda, or, or, or whatever it, uh, it might be. So, if we then say individualism can mean, in a fairly narrow sense, if you have the capacity to be a special individual with your own goals and values and to go and make your mark and do something special in the world, then yes, Nietzsche is an individualist in that respect. However, uh, again, a large grain of salt here. Uh, Nietzsche's view is that even those individuals, those special individuals, they do not make themselves. It's not the case that I, Stephen Hicks, or you, Ricardo Lopez, or anybody out there can say, I have decided I'm going to make something of my life. And what should I do with my life? And I go on my journey of self-discovery, and I say, I want to be a philosopher, or an artist, or the first person to uh, colonize Mars or whatever the, the thing might be. Because even those individuals, those special individuals, they are not self-made individuals, the way we typically think of Renaissance individuals or the, the traditional phrase of being a self-made man. Instead, those individuals, Nietzsche believes, are selected 
by forces beyond their control. And so here we, again, we need to get to the metaphysics and his doctrine of power, his doctrine of the will to power, um, and his quasi-evolutionary views and uh, my reading of Nietzsche, uh, although he does have some evolution in his views, is that what he calls us is that various evolutionary forces uh, over the course of many generations are mixing and matching and so on, and every once in a while out pops a special individual with some special capacity, some special drives, and that person did not make himself or make herself. Rather, he or she is just something that the underlying sea of power has happened to have constellated, if I can use that word, in a, in a particular chunk that we call a, a human being, and it now has the capacity to go on and do some, some special things. Now, the way I think to think about it is, if we think about individualism the way we normally do, what we say things is to people, develop your capacities, develop your skills, increase your power, and then use your power that you have acquired uh, for your ends that you have chosen. So see power as a tool for your ends. And Nietzsche is reversing that. Right? He's not saying that you should use power. Rather, power is the ontological substrate, or it is the metaphysical being, and it is working through you, right? or it is working through those special individuals. So it's not that he's arguing that individuals should acquire and use power for their ends. Rather, it's that power uses individuals. You are a tool of the real power of the universe. So the analogy that I like to use here is uh, a religious analogy. If you think of uh, prophets or mystics in various traditions, and we take a stereotypical view of how this works, we say the real power in the universe is the gods, or God, just to, to keep it simplified. And God is has his plan and his agenda for the world. And what God does, though, once in a while is looks down and chooses some individual and visits upon that individual uh, a mystical insight or a revolution, revelation or infuses that individual with some special magical revelatory power. And then that person is a very special person in that religious tradition and stands above the sheep right, who are then going to follow that person or be used by that person. But Remember, the status of that special prophet or mystic is that that person is not a self-made man. Rather, he is a tool or a vehicle through which God is working or the gods are working. So if you strip that out of its uh, religious context and put it in a more biological, evolutionary, uh, physicalistic, materialistic context, something like that is what we get in Nietzsche. So... Yeah, we do have special individuals, but it's not at all individualism as we typically think of it in the Western tradition or specifically the Western Enlightenment tradition. So that's a longer answer than I think perhaps we were expecting, but this is a very rich topic. So Nietzsche, sort of an individualist in some ways, but overall not. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess his views on individualism are a bit complicated, but I guess that the part about the distinction he made between the great man and basically the rest of humanity connect very well with the views he had on another value of enlightenment that is progress. So ah. he was basically, we could say, I think that he was not a big fan of universal human rights and equal participation of people in politics via democracy and international cooperation between peoples and nations <laughs> and things like that. Right. Would, you, would you say that another point to it coming from Nietzsche is that uh, you would think that in order for us to um, pursue those values, we would have to tame our natural instincts to a point where mm. we would risk losing a lot of vital force or something like that. Yeah, that's that's nicely said. Yes, uh, Nietzsche is very much uh, anti-democratic, 
small d democratic, anti-capitalistic, uh, anti-universalistic, uh, anti-any conception of liberalism. He very forthrightly says he's by no means in any way, shape, or form, whatever definition you want to put on liberalism, I'm not that. Right. So he is uh, very much, again, opposed to the, the social and political manifestations of the Enlightenment with its liberalism, its capitalism, its some form of democratic republicanism, its uh, view of equal and universal rights, uh, and, and so on. Uh, the way you put that in the middle of your formulation, I think, is, is, is good, because he does think if uh, we are going to achieve that view of progress, then we would have to tame our instincts. And the way he puts it is that that's largely what the Enlightenment project, or much of, uh, uh, even before the Enlightenment, the, the Western project has been, is the, the domestication of man to take the human being that can be a wild animal out there, like a lion or a wolf or an eagle soaring freely and having adventures and putting it in a cage so that it can live nicely and peacefully with the other animals as well. So uh, it's so a... Uh, just to interrupt you there, his views on morality are also that morality would work sort of as a social uh, tool to try also to tame our natural instincts. Yes, but again, it depends on what kind of morality you're talking about. So Nietzsche is very much relativistic on his morality. He sees morality as, a, as more of a projection of your psychological and biological makeup and then you know there's a spectrum from slave morality to master morality and we have different types of morality that are projections of of, uh, of where those people are but the broad more uh, uh, range of moralities largely influenced we might say by the judeo christian tradition in the west is largely a matter of uh, herd animal domestication making people safe and nice and not rocking the boat and, uh, and so on. So Nietzsche is uh, an anti-moralist in that respect. But he is always speaking a little ironically when he's doing that. We always have to realize he's talking about one particular dominant right, form of morality. He's uh, very much in favor of people being moralists, but in the sense of being legislators and generating new moralities. Uh, rather than just accepting uh, the, the current ones. So, uh, you started off that question, though, uh, with the concept of progress, and that's a value-laden term. I think Nietzsche is in favor of progress, a kind of progress. He is just against any Jewish, Christian, Muslim, or broadly Western religion view of progress, any Enlightenment liberal view of progress, any socialist or communist view of progress. He does uh, believe that human beings are on an evolutionary path and that human beings as they are are not the final stage of this evolutionary path and that we can improve. But he's very much not prescriptive of what that progress will look like because he does not see himself as one of the ubermensch he sees himself more as a, a herald of their coming as a, as a kind of midwife uh, the socratic ironic references is, is important to him there but he's very much anti-socratic but it's more a matter of what he wants to do is to speak to those of us who might have something special in us, the way many of us have when we are younger, that I can do something special. And Nietzsche is urging us to pay attention to those voices inside us, or those, those drives to do something, to break free from the comfortable surroundings that we're in, and not to accept the package of beliefs and norms and the career paths that are set out for us and the expectations that are placed on us, but rather genuinely to see ourselves as legislators, to create anything that seems true and genuine to who you are fundamentally, and to create your own value framework. And uh, out of that, 
have no idea what that will be. It's like you can't, if you think of artists here, you can never tell an artist what he or she could create. All you can do is, after the fact, say, I like it or I don't like it. That's Nietzsche's perspective. But it genuinely has to come from the artist. And those of us who are moralists or valuers in Nietzsche's sense want to say, not everything awesome that can be done in art has been done. What we can do as teachers and as mid and midwives is encourage those who have some artistic spark in them to really go for it. And out of that, there will be wonderful new creations. And it's not just in art for Nietzsche, it's in any field of, uh, of human endeavor. So he does think there will be progress, uh, but it's an unpredictable and per currently unspecifiable kind of progress. There will be human beings who are more awesome than we are down the road. And if we have any sort of moral responsibility, it's to uh, respect and make possible those individuals uh, coming into existence and uh, enabling them, or if we are ourselves those individuals, cultivating and expressing that in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, and what about his views on science in general? Because from what you said earlier about his views on objectivity and rationality, we already know that his philosophy would undermine these two concepts that are two of the basic foundations of science. Yes. But, but on the other hand, because of his views on morality and how it could be used uh, to tame people and so on and so forth. Do you think that because morality is outside uh, of the domain of inquiry of science and because the knowledge that science discovers or produces is, yeah. not, val is not value laden, that you would think that science would be of some value? I was, yeah, there's a lot packed into what you just said. That's a very sure. rich and important question. I think Nietzsche's views on science are going to be as complicated as his views on morality or on individualism. Uh, so there's a lot that has to be unpacked on there or, or in there. So <clears throat> I think one thing I would say, though, is I think in Nietzsche, we do not have the dichotomy between science and valuing that is part and parcel of certain more positivistic philosophical outlooks that are part of Western philosophy. Nietzsche would reject that. Uh, what uh, has happened in Western philosophy is there has been this distinction between the descriptive and the normative, and we tend to dichotomize them, uh, or between facts and values, or between science and morality. And I think that dichotomy has been false and has been very destructive but for reasons different from, uh, from Nietzsche's, but this is not about my views right now, this is about Nietzsche's views. I think what Nietzsche would say is, what many people have tried to do is to say that we're worried about values uh, and normative biases and preconceptions infecting our science. So what we want to do is try to bracket values and morals as much as possible and just be pure calculating logic science machines, and then we'll worry about the value implications afterwards. Or that what we need to do is, uh, since values seem to be tied up with our passions and our emotions, is set aside our emotions, set aside our passions, and turn ourselves into computers, or like Mr. Spock in the Star Trek uh, fictional sense. Uh, and we have then the stereotype as the scientist as a kind of a pure Mr. Spock kind of character. Uh, now, I think that is a stereotype and a cartoon version of how science can and should operate. But Nietzsche would say that's impossible, and I think also he's right to say that that is, that is impossible. We always are valuing, moralizing, judgment creatures, uh, and that those need to be integrated in some way. Now then, Nietzsche in particular, though, goes the other way. I think his view is that our values come first, and what we then think is rational, scientific, and moral is second. That when we start to try to abstract and conceptualize and form theoretical frameworks, uh, 
in language to articulate our views, they are already a uh, an articulation or an attempt to articulate a framework that we have committed to on pre-scientific, pre-rational grounds. So his value-laden subjectivism comes first. So in that sense, the idea of science as a disinterested, objective approach to understand reality as it really is, Nietzsche says that's just not possible. So that cartoon version of what enlightenment science is all about, he would reject all of that. So, now at the same time though, if you have a broader understanding of science, uh, Nietzsche's thinking does go through more or less scientific phases. Earlier, you might say he's much more metaphysical in a, in a quasi-traditional metaphysical way, but then he sheds that in his me metaphysical phase and he becomes more materialistic or physicalistic or biologicalistic, whatever word you want to use here. Uh, and he does title one of his mature books, The Joyous Science. Uh, and he does see himself then as a scientific sense, a thinker rather, if you have a broader conception of science. So uh, in, a, in a short interview, I don't know that we can say a whole lot more without drilling down. So something like that. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think we already went through the main attacks of Nietzsche on the Enlightenment. So mm -hmm. now to get more specifically uh, on the... Um, the themes about if he influenced really Nazism or not, because from his writings and uh, due to what you said on the on the book Nietzsche and the Nazis, and again I recommend that people go check that book out because it's very important for this conversation. Uh, he didn't. He wasn't really anti-Semitic, and on the other hand, he also didn't really espouse the idea that the German people or the or the Aryan race were superior to any other. Right. So. So, yeah. So that's yeah. Two points, and both of those are important points. Yeah, I do think that Nietzsche was anti-Semitic, but in a low-grade, fairly common sense. He was not a hardcore, virulent, nasty anti-Semite, the way we have the, the, the true stereotype uh, that was there. And anti-Semitism is a very deep problem in, uh, in German and more broadly European thinking. So uh, he did have some of the cultural biases, but I would say in a fairly modest form. But at the same time, we do have to recognize that Nietzsche also praises the Jews for, uh, for their intelligence, for their intellectual honesty, and so he does have many positive things to say about the Jews, and he does recognize them as an absolutely important cultural intellectual force, and he has, in some cases, it's kind of a sneaking admiration for what they have been able to accomplish. I mean, if you think about all of human history, how many value frameworks, how many cultural identities have been able to keep it together for as many centuries and millennia as the Jews. It's, uh, you know, well, I can't think of any that, uh, and so there is something important there, and so Nietzsche, Nietzsche does have some admiration there. So that certainly is going to set him against the virulent anti-Semitism that we do find in the, in the Nazis. And Nietzsche is also very forthright at various points in saying how disgusted he is at uh, his generation of anti-Semites, you know, how they are, really pathetic loser types, the way uh, now I think most of us who are decent people think of most anti-Semites now as very pathetic loser types of people. So he has the same disgust uh, for them. Now, as for the Germans, uh, we know that the, the Nazis thought of the Germans, or more broadly the Aryan type, as the world's great hope, as special, perhaps chosen by God to have this world historical uh, leadership role in, in showing the world the great new path. Nietzsche, by contrast, was very disgusted by the Germans of his generation. He did think the Germanic type way back in the past uh, had accomplished something significant and they were worthy of being feared and respected, but he thought his generation of Germans were pathetic, again, mostly losers more interested in socialism, Marxism, communism, uh, 
various kinds of religious revivalism and hoping that somehow God is going to come along and save them. And so he's just disgusted by all of those very prominent trends of his time. So on both of those scores, yes, uh, he is uh, very much Mm anti-Nazi. Okay, so on that note, would you say that it is fair to say that Nietzsche was a major influence on Nazism as a political ideology, uh, or that what was really important here was the effects, the way his sister Elizabeth changed or distorted his writings and yeah. turned them into more explicitly anti-Semitic, that those were the main things that influenced uh, Nazism. Okay. Let me take those in reverse order, uh, starting with his sister, Elizabeth Forster Nietzsche. Uh, I I want to start with a recommendation. There's a new translation uh, of The Will to Power, published either early this year or late last year by Penguin Books. uh, And the translator is uh, Kevin Hill, who is a first-rate philosopher, first-rate Nietzsche scholar, excellent. And in that, he has a long introduction to will to power, its status, and he takes up this issue of uh, Nietzsche's sister Elizabeth and her alleged influence. Uh, So he is the true scholar on this, and my view is that he is essentially right. My view for a long time has been that the blaming things on the sister is really a red herring, a distraction, and overstated. Uh, so let me let me just say this: Nietzsche lost his mental capacities in 1890 or so, and was dysfunctional. His literary remains uh, were turned over who, to his sister, and she is in in charge of them. And there's then an edition of the Will to Power that comes out in the 1890s. I think it's in the, the, toward the end of the 1890s. And then there's a fuller edition that comes out in the decade after Nietzsche, Nietzsche dies. But the important thing to say here is that uh, I think it was something like 480 or so of the excerpts from Nietzsche's notebooks that were published, and that's about half of them, actually a little less than, than half of them. Every word in those excerpts are words that Nietzsche wrote. None of the words were changed. Uh, there were no things that the sister wrote that she added and passed them off as Nietzsche's writing. So every word is a word that Nietzsche wrote. Uh, so all you can say at most, I think, is that Nietzsche wrote, say, 1,000, I think the number is 1,067 sections that are now in the full will to power, is that she left out a little over half of them and didn't publish those, and that maybe if you read those, they would change the interpretation of some of the ones that were included. So I think that's one point that's uh, important to make. A second point is that she was not actually the editor, as far as I know. The editor was Peter Gast, uh, Heinrich Kozelitz, who was Nietzsche's very close friend, his uh, personal secretary, that person when Nietzsche had uh, bouts of blindness and could not write, the person who took dictation from Nietzsche during those, wrote down every single word, heard it directly from Nietzsche. He is the one who is doing the actual editing of the text. And this guy, Peter Gast, more than any other living human being, has knowledge of what was actually on Nietzsche's mind. And he is the one who's actually editing the text. So, with those provisos in place, these were not authorized for publication by Nietzsche. Uh, so we do have to take them with a slightly lower canonical status to the works that he did actually publish in his lifetime. But with all that said, uh, I do think it's important to say he did say and write all of those words. They were uh, written down and edited by someone who knows his work intimately, and his sister was the publisher and the the middleman, so to speak, in bringing the works to to the public. So uh, at that point, I would say 
we can take those uh, uh, documents as, as as closely as we possibly can to indicating what Nietzsche's mature thinking was. Now, the idea, though, also that we somehow get misled by the will to power and get some sort of a distorted view of what Nietzsche stands for, I think, is also kind of silly because every single other of Nietzsche's works and there are a dozen major works at this point, have been published. They are widely read by intelligent people. And so if we have any question, we say, oh, we read this passage in The Will to Power, what does Nietzsche mean? Uh, that we can always interpret it as scholars and intelligent people do in the light of his actually published works. Out of my view, uh, I'm not... Uh, you know, one of the top 10 Nietzsche scholars in the world uh, who dedicated my life to it. But on my well-read, I've read almost everything that Nietzsche has, has written. Uh, my view is that it's all congruent with everything else that Nietzsche wrote. There are a couple of places where you might say he's making a change or transition here. and We need to make some alteration, and that's fine. So that's the kind of the textual philosophical point. But I do also think it's important to make a, a historical uh, point here. Um, his sister was a, was a Nazi, and that was a point of friction between, not, not, not a Nazi, an anti-Semite, but certainly a, a, the kind of person who would be a gung-ho supporter of Nazism, as she was a little bit later. And the, the Nazi party themselves, they did uh, respect her and admire her, and because of her standing culturally, brought her into the fold and used her for, for public relations purposes, uh, but also because the Nazi leaders, both intellectuals and, 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 uh, and party leaders, the politicians, did genuinely admire Nietzsche. So there was a genuine admiration there. This will be the second point here. But the important point historically is that after World War II and the Nazis have lost <clears throat> and they are justifiably and properly being vilified, uh, there was a huge movement in Nietzsche scholarship to try to distance Nietzsche as much as possible from the Nazis. And so uh, since Nietzsche is a genuine philosopher and we need to take his views seriously, there are many number of people who are, I think, genuine in their attraction to Nietzsche, but who are appalled by the, the Nazis and their scholarship then has a built-in bias to it, where they want to downplay as much as possible any connection to Nazism uh, that they can. Now, I think now that the Nazis have been over, you know, they probably are coming back in various forms, unfortunately, now. But now that uh, we are 60, 70, 80 years past the generation of the real Nazis, the real fascists, I think the scholarship is now much better, and we are in a position to have a more nuanced understanding of how, in fact, in many ways, Nietzsche was legitimately an influence on the Nazis, and they did properly draw upon Nietzsche for some, some proper things. So that's my answer only to the first half of your, sorry, that was the second half of your question on, on Elizabeth. I don't know if you want to uh, say something now since I've been talking for a few minutes, or if we want to just jump into the first half of your question. Uh, no, no I, I just wanted to say that I, I would really like to thank you for sharing that particular information about the new edition, the new translation of the Will to Power, because I didn't really know that it was out, and, and yes. I will check it later. So, and now, yes, go ahead and please talk a little bit about uh, perhaps how Nietzsche might have worked as an influence for Nazism <coughs> in, in other ways that we didn't talk about here yet. Right. So, first, a, a general point. Uh, when we start talking about philosophy, philosophy is very abstract and operates in terms of general principles. Um, so there always is a question about taking abstract principles and applying it politically. And in many cases, a very general set of principles does leave open any number of particular manifestations within a, within a certain branch. But at the same time, we can say John Locke did not predict the particular form that the American Revolution was going to take. But nonetheless, we can say John Locke's general principles are very much 
of a piece with the particular manifestation they have in the American political documents. The same way we can say Jean-Jacques Rousseau, operating more generally, is a very powerful influence on the particular manifestation of Jacobin, Jacobin, uh, Jacobin thinking in uh, uh, Robespierre, Marat, in the French Revolution and others. Karl Marx, uh, the exact form that communism is implemented can take a number of forms, but we can say, yes, Marx to Lenin, Marx to Mao, the connections are there. So the same thing I think is true with respect to, to, uh, to Nietzsche. Nietzsche is anti-liberal, anti-capitalistic, uh, anti-democratic republicanism. And so those general principles are compatible with a large number still of illiberal, authoritarian, dictatorial, uh, conflict-oriented political philosophies. And Nazism or National Socialism, I think, is a prominent one in that mix. So the way I think to think about it is twofold. One is to say, look at the actual Nazi intellectuals, people like Muller van den Broek, who's writing a book called The Third Reich in the 1920s that sells millions of copies. Uh, and he's arguing forthrightly for a kind of Nietzschean national socialism. And this is a guy who is brilliant, a first-rate intellectual. He's not a political party animal. He sees himself as an idealist, and he is a, a, a political philosopher. He is forthrightly understanding Nietzsche, getting it basically right, and arguing for an, an application of that to a kind of national socialist, we could say small n nationalist, small s socialist principle, and uh, very comfortable with actual Nazi party politics at the time. Or someone like Oswald Spengler, who wrote The Decline of the West, but uh, in 1920, uh, again, writing a book that sells in the millions, arguing, or, or the title of a book is you know, Prussianism and Socialism. Uh, so if we just take Prussianism and substitute nationalism and combine that with socialism, then again, we have someone who's very read in Nietzschean philosophy and Nietzschean political philosophy, arguing for a political philosophy that looks a lot like what the Nazis are then going to implement. We can look at a philosopher like Martin Heidegger, and it's very hard for anybody to say that, well, Martin Heidegger didn't really understand Nietzsche. Well, no, you might have differences of opinion about how exactly to interpret Nietzsche, but Heidegger is one of the geniuses and very much influenced by Nietzsche and very uh, legitimate as an interpreter of Nietzsche. And in his practical philosophy is not only arguing for something like small n national socialism or small uh, lowercase national socialism, but joined the Nazi party and is a gung-ho Nazi. So the intellectuals who are the intellectuals of national socialism are all Nietzschean to a, to a great extent. This carries through when you look at the Nazi party leadership. Adolf Hitler admired Nietzsche. Joseph Goebbels admired Nietzsche. Uh, Goebbels had a PhD. Now you can argue he's a party hack, but he's also brilliant. He's also well educated, and he might very well be twisting Nietzsche to various ends, and undoubtedly he is doing that. But you can't say that there is no connection there. There are lots and lots of very powerful connections. Now what those connections are is, again, we have to go up a level of abstraction. Right, one thing is to say that Nietzsche is very much anti-democratic, anti-republican. Uh, and the Nietzsche, uh, sorry, the, the Nazis are anti-democratic, anti-republican. So that then is to say, if you say, here's political philosophy, and we take all of the political thinkers, John Locke, John Stuart Mill, uh, Adam Smith, and so on, who are broadly speaking on the liberal democratic republican camp, right, Nietzsche, is forthrightly rejecting all of that. The Nazis are forthrightly all rejecting that. So they're on the same side of that dividing line. Uh, another important line is how are we going to uh, conceptualize what we think the ultimate goals of politics are? 
And what we find coming out of the liberal capitalist tradition is the idea that what we should be striving for is peace among nations. That what we should be doing is trying to bring an end to war, to develop commercial republics in which people are free to trade and produce with each other, that a lot of these national boundaries need to be lessened, we should have free trade agreements and be cosmopolitan, and that liberal capitalist internationalist perspective that again we start to see developed in Locke and Montaigne and Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill, Nietzsche and the Nazis are very much on the opposite side of that, with the possible exception of the cosmopolitanism in Nietzsche. But the idea that peace is not our goal, uh, trade and being a commercial marketing people is not our goal. Instead, conflict and aggression and the imposition by the stronger on the weaker to the point of using the weaker for uh, slave purposes to satisfy the agenda of the stronger people. All of those you find in Nietzsche at a level of abstraction, and the Nazis are very much buying into all of those principles. We are about conflict, we are about war, we are about the stronger people imposing their agenda on the weaker people and using them for their agenda. So again, you have a strong congruence there. So uh, they are in the same general ballpark, to use a, an American baseball metaphor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Ricks, I know that we'll, we'll have to end in a few minutes, so I will just ask you a, a final question to try to establish a bridge between our first conversation that was about postmodernism, ah. basically, yep. uh, and uh, Nazi ideology to try to have also the influences of Nietzsche between the two because yeah. uh, i find it i found it interesting uh, after reading your book nietzsche and the nazis that we can establish some interesting parallels between nazi ideology and postmodernism so i i wrote down a few here like collectivism a strong cause a strong belief in the cause uh, espousing a socialist economy the battle between different ethnicities and races espousing authoritarian authoritarianism. So yes. could you please give us perhaps a more concise answer about mm. what what you would have to say about these interesting parallels? Yes, absolutely. Um, well, certainly the postmodern thinkers like Foucault and, and the others are very much uh, Richard Rorty influenced by Nietzsche. At one point, Foucault, this is a footnote in my postmodernism book, uh, at one point Foucault says, you know, basically, I am just a Nietzschean. Right? I am just updating and applying a Nietzschean perspective on text and social dynamics in, in the world. So that connection is there. Uh, another connection, I think, is to uh, Carl Schmitt, another uh, brilliant political thinker, but he is beloved by both Nazi thinkers and was himself a Nazi supporter and this generation of postmodern thinkers as well. Uh, if we look, again, more crudely at our own generations, we say, well, there's the alt-right and there seem to be all of these neo-fascistic, neo-Nazi types of movements, and there's also anti-fa, but at a certain level of fuzziness, there doesn't seem to be a lot of difference between the two for all of the reasons that you just indicated. The, the collectivism, the irrationalism, the embracing of violence, and, and so on. And then it just becomes a matter of details. So uh, at the level of street fighting, it's almost like you go into any bad city where it's dominated by gangs and you say, wow, you know, these gangs wear red bandanas and this gang wears gray bandanas. They're so different. They, you know, the colors are different parts of the spectrum or blue bandanas or whatever it would be. But really, they are playing the same game just on behalf of different gangs. Now, to upgrade that to more philosophical language, the most important points here, I'll just make one epistemological point and one value point. Uh, there's a big difference politically between those who advocate rational approaches to politics and those who advocate irrational approaches to politics. If you think human beings are fundamentally rational, uh, and by that you mean they have the capacity for rationality, 
that they can all learn how to exercise it and that it's a, an important thing for parents to educate children to be reasonable, to exercise independent judgment, to give them the tools to be thoughtful, reflective, rational people in their world, then you will end up with a kind of liberal democratic Republican politics. If by contrast you think that people are basically irrational, that they are dominated by instincts or by passions, and that it's not uh, you're not interested in training young people to exercise independent judgment, then you will set them up for irrational conflicts in their in their agendas. And necessarily people, uh, it's, I think it's very frightening to try to approach the world if you don't have or confidence in your capacity for rationality and you don't think of other people as rational people with whom you can have uh, fruitful discussions about their differences, then I think naturally what you will do is join some group. There is safety in numbers and you will brace yourself for battle against other groups that are, that are out there. So one thing that is common to both fascists, Nazis, and the postmodernists is that they are deeply irrationalist in their epistemology and necessarily that means a certain kind of politics. You will not look for democracy, republicanism, universal principles, the idea that somehow we're going to talk about our differences, that we can objectively agree on a certain set of facts, that there are canons of logic and civility that we should abide by when we are engaging in our political discourse. You will do politics in nasty, conflict, brutal sorts of ways. The other thing, of course, is the, the value concept, the collectivism. The Nazis and the, and the fascists we know are thoroughgoing collectivists. Your identity is formed by the various ethnic and racial collective groups that you are born into. The exact thing holds for most of the postmodernists, except it's in a uh, much more linguistic form, uh, the languages uh, or, 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 or epistemological form, the paradigms or theory-laden frameworks and value frameworks that the social groups that we are born into uh, mold us to believe, right? or now it's broadened in various identity politics ways that were all constructed by gender, uh, sex, ethnicity, race, et cetera, et cetera, identities. But again, you don't, you're not an individual. You are a formed social construct and they just have different social constructs compared to the Nazis and the fascists. So you're going to get, again, uh, similarities at a level of abstraction, and it's just going to be different kinds of gangs with different particular allegiances fighting it out in brutal form, and that's what we're starting to see. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Ricks, I'm really sorry if I have kept you a bit past your time well, limit. I hope that's there, the way that's philosophical not... discussions go, right? Uh, it's hard yeah, to put a yeah, time and on I, And I mean, Nietzsche is an almost endless subject, right? Absolutely. <laughs> and sure. it's extremely difficult to talk about his views, so I guess you couldn't have given shorter answers than those that you gave us. So, uh, and again, I would really like to thank you for taking the time. I mean, perhaps in a few months we'll have to do another uh, interview just about Nietzsche, but this time applied more specifically perhaps to postmodernism and how we might have influenced more specifically uh, these philosophical waves. So again, thank you a lot for taking the time and well, it was really fun. Good, yeah, good questions. We did cover a lot of ground in an hour and uh, thanks again for having me on. Oh, it's, a pl it's my pleasure. Thank you. Hi everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. I would also like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and consider making a pledge if you like the work that I've been doing. And I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Peralga Larsen, Lau Guerrero and Chantal Gelinas. Thank you for all.